The following program has been funded in part by grants from the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts and the people of Chevron in Hawaii. One of the reasons why I wrote the 30 years of riding the world's biggest waves was that no one had ever done anything like that. It's not just a book how to surf, it's mainly short stories that involve me. It's mostly autobiographical, it's all true. There's one story that's a conglomerate, the old man who loves surfing, but all the rest of them are true. They are my experience. A lot of people don't believe them. I, I think my wife is one of the few people who believes the Klitschko Bosky story, but it happened exactly that way, and it happened before drugs. It was 1950, so <laughs> it was it was an experience that you don't usually have. But if you're a surfer, or if you're in the ocean, you have unusual experiences. You encounter different kinds of things that are not the same as what you encounter on the freeway or at your job, and that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get this down because. It's history and it's unusual happenings that I've never heard anyone describe uh, autobiographically. And it feels good for me and the response has been great. I'm into the second printing. The only problem is advertising and getting it out to the public. You know, as soon as I get advertising, it sells. As soon as that's over with, then people forget it. It was really an honor to work on Change We Must for and with Nana Viri because, because of her life, many people had approached her about writing something on her life and uh, we were fortunate enough to be involved in the actual putting together of this book. And it was quite a lengthy process because here you have a woman whose life spanned and spans most of, the, most of a whole century, 80 years. So she has seen a lot of changes and in that time has explored, had explored many paths. So the book was, it, it demanded that we capture her life story through her thoughts and the path of her search, as well as, you know, she had many lectures. She had given classes in metaphysics years and years ago. And so we just put all the material together spent many, many more hours talking with her, interviewing her, heard many stories about her past, transcribed tapes from her lectures 10 and 15 years ago, and put it in a cohesive form that we felt could anchor her story and bridge the Hawaiian teachings and the reverence for life with metaphysics. The way I came to write my time in Hawaii was interesting, I think, because uh, the idea first came to me about three years ago and I was sitting around and feeling very blue and thinking that I'd never been happy in my life and suddenly I said to myself, oh, I remember when I was happy, I remember that and that was in Hawaii and that was in the late 60s and early 70s. And so I began writing down all the episodes, all the little details, all the funny quirks and habits and costumes and everything that makes Hawaii such a unique part of the world. And of course, my own experience, which was very much meshed with Hawaii in those days. And for three months, I did nothing but write these anecdotes and write them down. And I ended up with a string of about more than a hundred stories. So then the problem was, how was I going to put them together? And I experimented various ways, and I thought of making a scrapbook uh, of Hawaiian things. And originally, I had put a lot of quotes and uh, rap Replinger routine and quotes from Mark Twain's uncensored notebook and all of these wonderful little bits and snippets, kind of like a like a Polynesian quote. Um, 
but it was a very big scrapbook and I realized that it um, needed to be pulled together and that really uh, the organizing principle was not Hawaii the objective reality but Hawaii as I experienced it, I as a person who had my own point of view and own time here. So gradually over the next three years I compressed and rewrote and rewrote and changed and moved around and rethought and worked and slaved and finally uh, came up with the final version of it which is very subjective I would say although it has lots of facts and bits and pieces just like the original version did and it makes me happy that I did this because as soon as I started writing it down as soon as I transferred it from my memory onto the printed page it became something else and I lost my memories in a way and I have the book I when I think about the things that I wrote about in the book they're gone in a way because they're on the printed page now it's a funny thing that happens when you do that my involvement in uh, the book Waikiki Beach Boy uh, came about uh, almost by accident I got a phone call asking if I'd be interested in writing the book uh, the project originally had its uh, origins let's say um, back in the early 1960s, uh, a beach boy named Charlie Lambert, uh, who had been on the beach in the 50s, um, had the idea with some other beach boys one day when they were drinking after work. Uh, he carried that idea in his head for some 20 years, um, collecting pictures, collecting magazine articles. In 1982, Honolulu Magazine did a feature uh, cover story on the old time beach boys. And they did a, a story on him, a side story, um, in which he said he was looking for a publisher and he was looking for a writer. Uh, two years later, he found uh, Gaylord Wilcox, who's the uh, publisher of Editions Limited, uh, who's a member of the Outrigger Canoe Club and who had published um, the book uh, The Hawaiian Canoe by Tommy Holmes. And um, soon after that, I got a call asking if I'd be interested in being the writer. Now, one of the reasons they called me was because um, I had some background you know, on the Beach Boy story back in 1977. Um, an editor for Life Magazine and Sports Illustrated, uh, Richard W. Johnson, who was living out here, uh, had asked me to do some research for him on a story that, um, about the Beach Boys. His peg for the story was at that time, the, one of the major hotels in Waikiki was, was importing Beach Boys from Florida. And he was using this as kind of a, uh, an excuse or an angle do a story on the old time Beach Boys. Anyways, I spent about six weeks down on the beach collecting anecdotes and um, learning a lot about the Beach Boys. So when I got the call in uh, 19, uh, I guess it was the later part of 1984, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was very interested in doing the project. Um, I had, it was funny because after I had read the Honolulu story, I remember thinking that if there was a book that I would like to do, it, it would be the Beach Boys because I had background as a sports writer and it was just uh, a very colorful story, a very a, a story with a lot of human interest uh, and a lot of sides to it. Uh, so it almost was very serendipitous that it, that, it, that it turned out the way it did, and the project, you know, uh, came to me. Yeah, you know, the the whole idea behind at least my emotional thing attached to the ocean or attached to anything in nature, it has to do with society. Society has always been a binding factor for me. I was raised a Catholic, which just about destroyed my sex life, at least when I was a young kid. And my only way of getting away from all those binding pressures in, in society was to go into the ocean. Because when I was in the ocean, I got into the trough and crest. And when I was in the trough and crest, I couldn't see the land and I couldn't see the horizon. So for that split second, I was protected and I was in my own free world where no one could talk to me, no one could contact me, tell me that my income tax is due, or that I had a problem at home, or that I was supposed to teach a way, a certain way. Or I, it was my life free. So surfing and getting into the ocean, or into the mountains, or in, just into, into a, a, a lake or stream, was the way I found freedom, and I found myself as an individual. And the society, pressures and tensions were nothing in those days compared to what they are now. 
but for me it was relative. And getting back to that old Catholic church again, they really put a lot of pressure on me for all kinds of performances, grade-wise, physically, emotionally. And I didn't realize that it was having its effect. And so I gravitated to being by myself, and the ocean was the natural thing, because no one could get out to the ocean I went into. There were very few people who could make it out to the shore break at Flyshacker Zoo in San Francisco. And those few who might make it out, lots of them didn't like it once they got out there because it was way out in the ocean. And there were white sharks, and there were rip currents, and there were tidal changes that were, that could eat you up. People died in that. There was an ordinance against swimming. You could wade up to your knees, but if you tried to dunk and swim, the police who came, went up and down that beach on their horses would uh, give you a ticket. At that time, it was only 25 bucks, but it was still a ticket. Now, that, uh, that's, that's a point of view that's different than the one, nowadays it's media hype, it's the records, it's the in thing. I was an outcast when I surfed. I, I was like a, I hate to use this word, but the, the, the motorcycle gang type, you know, the, the Hell's Angels. We, I wasn't like that, but that's the way people looked at me. They expected to see me with a black jacket and, you know, and, and no responsibility. But getting into the ocean gave me that, that, that spirit that was lacking in the society. It gave it back to me. And so, slowly but surely, going into the ocean, I recaptured what I was before the Catholic Church took hold of me. Working with Nana, well, not only working with Nana, but just being around Nana is like being around Hote. For me, that's the image that crystallizes who Nana is the most. Hote is this big pot-bellied monk in the Zen tradition who symbolizes the highest level of self-development. Hote carries a, a gourd of sake and a sack of fish. He's not supposed to have either of those as a Buddhist priest. But at this level, the idea is you can do whatever you please, and whatever you do will accord with the way. And wherever you go, you'll take suffering away from people and turn them into Buddhas. For me, Nana's like this. Although Nana, instead of using bliss bestowing hands like Hote does, hugs you. And when she hugs you, she takes you to her heart and she squeezes away the constricted sense of self you might have and you lose your suffering in the love that she is. Putting Nana's thoughts into print wasn't that difficult because it's so clear and simple and beautiful. So it, it uh, unlike, you know, uh, philosophical reflections, really comes across very well, clearly and deeply to, to the reader. The h most difficult part was uh, getting Nana to uh, get over some of her shyness about things and uh, helping her uh, overcome her cold feet at one point. <laughs> but I, I promised her the book would be great. <laughs> and everybody has said that it, it was and it's spoken to them a lot. Well, my book was published I think, um, in good part because I am a writer, I've written other books, I have a literary agent, I have plugged back into the mainland literary tradition. Um, what always concerns me is the fact that Hawaii's current literature, which has really been growing by leaps and bounds, it's always been here, but especially in the 70s, uh, there began to be a whole new feeling about Hawaiian identity and literature coming out of Hawaii, written by people who were born and raised here, as opposed to the uh, person who comes from somewhere else and looks at the place and then uh, writes about it. Um, Unfortunately, I think that situation still is true in terms of getting Hawaiian literature and Hawaiian writers today to be recognized as part of the grand American multi-ethnic tradition. There's been a lot of interest in the mainland and a great deal of encouragement for Hispanic writers, uh, Chinese American writers, 
Afro-American writers, not that the situation is great for them or that it's great for anybody who tries to be a serious writer in America. Uh, and I would like to see that kind of consciousness uh, applied to Hawaii. It was not easy for me at all to break into uh, the literary mainstream and the situation is twice as hard or five times as hard, I think, in a way, for somebody out here. Um, James Michener can write Hawaii and the world will look and listen and read uh, and it isn't to uh, uh, denigrate that book particularly, but uh, there are so many grand books that I hope are being written now and will be written by people here. Wonderful opportunities. You could stand Melville on his head. You could have an Ishmael who starts out in Hawaii, a Hawaiian of whatever background, uh, and uh, who makes a journey to the mainland and who looks at the mainland from the eyes of uh, an islander. That would be a fascinating, beautiful story to be told, and I'm sure that someone is going to tell it someday. Um, I've mentioned before that uh, the level of ignorance about Hawaii is, cannot be underestimated on the mainland. <laughs> And uh, especially as you move across the Mississippi River and uh, uh, get into the eastern urban region, it's just uh, really is a foreign country. It might as well be the Marquesas in terms of what people uh, know about Hawaii and all the kinds of people who live here. New York is really the funnel, as I said, where all the literature of America must pass through and an incredible amount gets filtered out going through that narrow fun funnel so what comes out on uh, in your local bookstore uh, is what has passed through that very narrow uh, very subjective screening process in New York and uh, someday I hope uh, in the not too distant future there will be uh, a, someone is going to say, oh yes, there's another state out there and uh, there are voices out there uh, and we want to listen to them. We want to know, not only know about this place, there are two considerations here. It's not only the place itself, it's also the artfulness of the writers. Uh, and to develop a literary tradition you have to be published and have an audience and so the two kind of feed each other um, and uh, uh, this process has a long way to go for Hawaii uh, and I, I hope that um, uh, I hope that people here will not lose heart if they're struggling writers it's a terrible situation to be in any part of the world and especially America where literature is a product like toilet paper. Uh, uh, you cannot expect large financial rewards of any kind if you're a serious writer. You have to be very clear about that. Uh, so if people here with the determination to go through that ordeal by fire uh, can break through and, and get that literature through, uh, that would make me very happy and I'm sure a lot of other people as well. It took me about a, about a four-year process of putting the Waikiki Beach Boy book together. Um, I work full-time, so it was mainly a, a matter of doing it on weekends, doing it uh, in the evenings. And as much energy as you have, uh, it's, it's hard to keep going on that kind of a schedule for you know, three or four years. That's basically you're working seven days a week, every week. And... Uh, so that's, that's one difficulty uh, in doing a project. And I remember talking with George Cooper, you know, who wrote Land of Power, and the, the one piece of advice he gave me when I started with my book was, was to watch your health. You know, he said, keep physically active, because otherwise you're, it's gonna really gonna affect how fast you put, together, put the book together and, and just uh, the whole quality of the book, because your energy runs down at a certain point. And he was very correct about that. After, about three years, um, it got harder and harder to maintain a good pace, you know, on writing the book. Um, a second thing that 
that was difficult was that my book relied mainly on original research. I mean, I went out and I interviewed over a hundred people, and um, I didn't come from a background of being a, a surfer or being somebody who knew everybody on the beach. So I had to work through people, and I had to work through contacts. When I got to know someone, and I'd ask them if there's someone else that they could introduce me to that I could talk to. And that's kind of how it, it went down the line. And it's a slow process, and, and it takes time for people to, to open up to you. And uh, sometimes, and Beach Boys are as fun guys as they are. They're notorious for, you know, not showing up. Uh, sometimes it would take three or four times, you know, after you schedule something with a Beach Boy before he kind of show up and sit down and, and, and open up to you. And sometimes one interview just wouldn't be enough. You know, he, he might start feeling comfortable with you at the end of the, the first interview. And if you went back a second or third time, you'd, you'd really get the, the stories you were looking for. So that was another difficulty. Uh, the third difficulty, I would say, was that I was also in charge of collecting the photos. And uh, it's just, people are very protective about their photos. Uh, and again, it's a matter of establishing trust with people before they will kind of turn the photos over to you. And usually they won't let you keep the photos, they'll let you make a, a copy of the photos. And you end up uh, spending a lot of time, you know, running from their, from all these different houses where you collected photos down to the photo lab to get the copies made and bringing the photos back and getting the caption information and then getting the release forms and um, sometimes when you get, you know, when you get, try to get them to sign the release, they balk and they want to show it to their lawyer and uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a great difficulty. Um, the other struggle is just organizing a book uh, like this that uh, also has not only writing but pictures. I was fortunate that I spent six years as an audiovisual producer. I was used to combining words with pictures and so that when I wrote the book, you know, I, I, I visually kind of blocked it out according to how, you know, the, the, the picture sections would go and how it would work not only as a written theme but as a kind of a visual theme. And um, it's it's uh, it makes it a more complicated process for writing because, like say, if this book didn't have pictures, I probably would have written it in a very different manner. Um, you had to find chapters uh, you know, around which there was pictures you could, around which you could, you know, you could focus a story or a, a profile. And um, so that was another problem or complication in, in, that I had to kind of work on in, in doing the book. Everyone needs humbling experiences every day, and everyone needs experiences where someone or something makes you feel great. And standing up in front of an audience, having a book, being able to talk about it, having people ask you questions, people who are really interested in who you are and why you wrote, is probably the most satisfying thing there is outside of a close relationship like I have with my wife. And I've done this many times now, and I've come away so high. I mean, it, it's a natural high, but it carries over for days. And it's, it's something, it, it's, it's like, it, it's almost, you're, you're beyond the realm of what you call conscious. You're on your unconscious level, and you're relating to people in a way that, that touches everything, and everything touches you. You cry and you laugh and, you know, anger comes out and, and happiness. And it's all tied together. And that's, that's what the book has done that for me in, in being in front of large pe groups of people who I walk in and I think, oh, my God, look at all those faces. They're going to kill me. They, you know, why do they want to listen to me? And then all of a sudden, feeling that, that audi the audience support it's one of the greatest things I've ever experienced. I, uh, it's hard to describe. It's almost like it's a, for want of a better word, it's almost like a psychedelic experience. It's beyond the regular realm of reality. One thing that she really emphasized personally and in the book was that kahunaism is basically pure metaphysics and her role was to demystify kahunaism and make its principles available to everyone so everyone would have the means to 
create changes and conditions with their thoughts, which is what the kahuna did. And her life is an example of that because she had the training from her grandfather who was a canoe builder, kahuna, and her grandparents who brought her up according to the uh, traditional Hawaiian ways. So she really impressed upon us the value, the spiritual values of a culture and a people that were really very, very close to nature inherently. And even the concept of aloha and, you know, aloha spirit, it was so much a part of their life that they didn't even have a name for it. So there's kind of a longing in this book for values that have, uh, have disappeared. When I came here this last time, I was renting a car and uh, the uh, kid behind the desk said, oh, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer. And his face lit up and he said, I've always thought that writing must be the area where your, your financial reward is, 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 is as big as your imagination. And you're only limited by, by your imagination. The, the, the more you, you can um, uh, dream, uh, the, the greater uh, your reward is going to be. And uh, that's, not, that's not quite true. It, it doesn't work out on a one-to-one -one, uh, money base. As long as you know that, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> In this town, publishing tends to be a, a, a pretty small business, and you end up, as a writer, doing most of the work. And you've got to be willing to do a lot of the work, do a lot of the legwork, you know, getting the photos. You, if you can save, if you have a good story idea, a good idea for pictures, you're willing to do a lot of the legwork, uh, be available for promotion, do things, and not, ex you know, not really expect in the long run to get paid for those things. And, and and I always maintain an attitude of, of being very cooperative and, and kind of realizing the expenses that are involved for the publisher and, and really how fortunate you are to have the opportunity to even do a book. It's a very humbling experience when you realize just how hard it is, how much work it is to, to put out a book. Um, people keep, one, the one question you have once you finish your first book, people say, well, what's your next book? And your thought is, my God, I don't, want, I don't know if I ever want to go through this again. 